So let's get started with the 820-3787 that is not turning on. So we're going to plug it in and see what it does. And we get no light on the charger, and it is dead. Uh, this is going to allow the charger to talk to the SMC. Let's look on pin 1 of U7000. Come on, turn down the exposure. This is in vice. Okay. Actually, what am I measuring? Let's see, pin four is one wire. Okay, pin one. Pin one is supposed to be PP, uh, is to see if this is turning on. And this chip is turning on. I'm getting 3.37 volts at this chip, yet I'm getting zero for my, for my green light. So let's see what adapter sense is. So adapter sense is going to show up on pin five over here. That's kind of weird. That's low. 0 0.7 volts and adapter sensed. I'm not sure if maybe that's something different from MagSafe 2, but that seems kind of low to me. Hmm. That seems low. Seems too low. Let's look at what the DC inboard looks like. DC inboard, are you crusty? Are you broken? Mm-hmm. Seriously? There you go. Okay, DC inboard, got the light on. But you're still dead. Why are you still dead? All right. Let's check out what adapter sense is now. Remember, adapter sense is supposed to be somewhere between, uh, usually around 2.9 volts. If it's 16, that's bad. That means that charger voltage is getting into the sense line. And if it's too low, that's also bad. If it's too low, it's bad because that means that, char that uh, it's not communicating. So, d bad, so, that, so the adapter sense voltage is going to let me know if the DC inboard is good or not most of the time. So now we got a green light, but it's dead. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check the rest of my voltages on the list. Let's check out PP bus G3 hot. Mm-hmm. on the fuse. And if you're short, it's a ground. This is getting sold a GTFO. You're four volts. OK, so four volts sucks, because that means that we're not short, it's a ground, but that we're also not creating the rail. But it's still better than being fully shorted. If it was 1.7 volts or 0 0.7 volts, then I'd be screwed. So let's see if there's a short circuit. That's not a short circuit for a line that's attached to just about everything. Yeah, th th that's fine. That's what we're expecting. Like somewhere between 0.125 to 0.184. So now let's look at the area that's going to create PP bus G3 hot, which is the U7100 area. So there's a couple of things that we're going to be looking for here. First thing is, how does it look? How healthy does it look visually? Visually, it looks pretty nice. So the first thing that I'm going to go through here is let's see what voltage I get on charger DCN at pin 2. Then we're also going to look for, actually, you can't see that. What do we get on charger DCN at pin 2? Do we get PP5E1 charger VDDP? And then also we're going to go over the current sensing section. We're going to make sure that these resistors for CSI, current sensing, current sensing for charger, I stands for charger. And here we have current sensing for battery, O stands for battery. Uh, that, that's that's in, a di in, in, uh, in this language, so I'm guessing that, that that's part of some other language. All right, so charger DC in, present. Now what we're going to do is we're going to check our current sensing section. So what I, here we, we have a loop. So this is a current sensing resistor. There's going to be a voltage drop across this resistor, and the voltage drop across R7120 is going to be proportional to the amount of current the system is using. So here you have where it says from adapter. So the, this, this entire point of this page of the circuit is to take the 16 or 18 volts from the charger and turn it into 12 volts for the system. So it's going to come through here, here. So the more current going through this resistor, the greater the voltage drop will be between the beginning and the end. Now, R7121 and R7122 are going to deliver those voltages to U7100. U7100 is going to compare them. And once the voltage difference is too great, it turns off the circuit or disables it. So since there is a 10-ohm resistor, then a 0.02-ohm resistor, 
and then another 10 ohm resistor. That means that I get to go to sleep. I mean, that means that, I, that the resistance that I get between pin 27 and 28 should be the sum of all those resistances, which would be 20.02 ohms. So let's find pins 27 and 28. Now, as you can see here, the resistance I get between pin 27 and 28 is 3 million ohms. 3 million is higher than 20.02, which means that one of these resistors, or both of them, are blown. As you can see here, each of these resistors has a little hole in the top of it. See? Each of those resistors has a hole in it, which means that they are blown. Now, what's going to cause those resistors to blow? Often, what's going to cause those resistors to blow is a path to ground. So those resistors sit between the charger and U7100. If U7100 goes bad, then it will short to ground. If U7100 is shorted to ground, then the things that are plugged into U7100 are also shorted to ground, like, let's say, the current sensing section. So we're not just going to replace the current sensing resistors. If the only problem were that the traces were bad, so let's say we were in a, in a case where the only issue with, these, with, with the, this circuit was that the trace, this to that, was broken. This was ripped up off the board, or this probe point was liquid damaged. Then we probably would not have to replace the U7100, and often we wouldn't even have to replace the resistors. However, since each resistor is blown, and the system is cosmetically perfect, the issue is most likely going to be an electrical issue. So if I were to measure resistance to ground on either one of those pins, I have a feeling that it's going to be very low. And as you can see here, I'm being proven wrong. And let's check this. And no, I'm not being proven wrong because on pin 28, we have a 2.1 ohm resistance to ground, meaning the U7100 is shorted to ground. So if I were to replace R7121 and R7122, it would be pointless because as soon as I plug in the charger, they blow again because U7100, which is our primary fault, is causing the secondary fault of our current sense resistors blowing. So we're going to repeal and replace both U7100 and the current sense resistors in order to fix this problem. So let's get the rework station on and get going. Let's get a tiny bit of flux on there. We're going to preheat the board a little bit since my office is cold and I have not done any soldering on this board yet. Don't want to thermally shock it. Are you not streaming on your other platform anymore? No, I'm streaming to YouTube. But just a different channel on YouTube that's meant for live video only. Just about done preheating. Now we can go in and repeal some stuff. Also, might as well turn off the multimeter. So that has all been repealed. Now we're going to wick the board, and after we wick out the old solder, it'll be time for the replacement stage. So 
So now we're going to add some leaded solder here because adding leaded solder makes it easier to repeal the lead-free solder. Now I'm going to take some wick. And we are going to repeal the lead-free, leaded solder combination that we have here. Remember, wicking is the professional way to repair. I learned this while I was teaching with Jess at iPad Rehab. Right before I quit teaching with her, she said, I don't want you to leave here without understanding the secret to how it is I have the highest success rate in the industry for liquid damage data recovery. And I said, Jess, what's the secret? Please tell me the secret. And she said, I wick every pad on every QFP, QFN, and BGA that I work on. And I said, wow, thank you so much. And I've been following that advice for the past two years, and as a result of following that advice, all of my repairs go amazing. Wick everything. What great advice. I just would have never thought of it on my own. Let me clean the area off. Okay, so I can safely say that the lead-free solder and the old chips have been repealed. Okay, now we're going to go for the ISL soldered on there. Now it's not flat on the board just yet, so I need it to be flat on the board. So I'm going to push. That was dumb. We're going to put that back into place in a second. 
Definitely not the ideal tip to be using to touch up QFP pads, but we like to live on the edge. And put you back into place. There. Like it never happened. All right. Wolfgang says, I think Eli is writing the YouTube drama thingy to attract more views. Uh, no comment. <laughs> no comment. Damn it, you're gonna make me use flux to touch that up, aren't you? All right. Okay, so now before I plug it in. I'm going to check resistance to ground on my current sense lines just to make sure that nothing funny is happening. I take black probe ground, red probe, and current sense. Hello. What, what's the range that we're in there? Okay, so in line... Change the range to... All right, I'd say that we're pretty safe here. Except I didn't really get the top done nicely since I was using that large BCM2 tip, which is really inappropriate for QFN soldering. I was being lazy. If you, you caught me being lazy there for a moment. I really should have had the something else on. It's a little better for that. But at, yeah, at this point, it's clear that our issue with the short on the current sense line is gone. And it's, see, much cleaner. Much cleaner. Okay, so now we're going to plug it in and see if the fan spins. So this is the fan. Look how, look how pretty it is. This is my charger. It spins! Isn't that great? So that's how we repair a machine that's dead, not turning on. That is how we figure out if the DC inboard is bad or not. Before you even grab a new DC inboard, the adapter sense line will give you some good hints as to whether your DC inboard is good. What, 2.9 to 3 volts good, 16 volts very bad, charger voltage is making its way into the adapter sense line, and zero anything considerably below 2 volts or like 0.7 volts means that it's not doing its job, it's not working at all. And now time for an advertisement.
this is our website here, mailin.repair, you will be able to find uh, most of the different cleaners, stencils, connectors, ICs, and uh, small chips that we use throughout these repairs on this website. So here you'll find the ultrasonic cleaner that we use at the store that's fixed many of the boards that I was unable to fix in the video. This here is shipped straight from the store. Here you'll see a bunch of LCD connectors. Uh, we've got keyboard connectors. We've got digitizer connectors, and they're all organized here. So if you go connectors by type, or you can search by your device. So if we go here, components by device, iPhone, iPhone 6S, it'll bring you to a screen where you'll find a bunch of different parts for your iPhone. The same is true for stencils. We've got stencils over here, like the SMC stencil, that it's typically hard to buy directly in America. You'll have to wait a long time to get that from China. Here we've got the... Uh, some different parts like the um, PP3V42 regulator over here. So this is a PP3V42 regulator. You can actually search by the number on the schematic. And if there are different chips with that same number, it'll bring up all the different chips. You can scroll down and figure out which one is for your motherboard. Because over here, it'll say compatible boards, and it'll list all the boards the chip is compatible with. If you don't want to deal with that, you can even just search by your motherboard. So if I search over here for 820-3462, it will only show me chips that are compatible with my model motherboard. And this was all put together with high resolution pictures that you can compare it to your chip to make sure that you buy the right one. And if you ever have a question, feel free to email, feel free to comment, feel free to live chat. So thank you very much for watching the video. Thank you very much for your patronage if you used our website. We've also got Flux here if you want Flux. We've got uh, solder paste over here if you want solder paste.